All right, good afternoon, people. How's everybody doing today? Y'all good? I see several of you have chosen to be outside, and I think that is an awesome idea. Um, I have too. I'm really enjoying it here on the beach today. Um, so far, it's been really nice. Um, I kind of overdressed for it, but other than that, it's, it's working out good. Um, no, I, I, I really am loving the, uh, the change. When I walked out this morning, it was amazing. So anyway, today, um, this is another chapter that of individuals that I've worked with um, particularly closely, some of these individuals. So we're gonna talk about therapeutic recreation and mental health. Um, so let me just go ahead and I'm going to jump on over and share the screen on the PowerPoint on that. All right, y'all got the PowerPoint, we good? Good deal. Um, so like I say, today we're going to talk about mental health, therapeutic recreation, how we can help people who fit this diagnosis. Um, I've got a lot of little notes I took on my papers today. So if you see me looking down, I got a lot of little things that I wanted to add that I don't want to miss. So we'll just get started. As far as the learning outcomes, um, one thing that I want you to take out of this is to know that, you know, we know that therapeutic recreation settings to work, one, you know, you've got geriatric settings, things such as that, and, and that's one. Now, there's also a lot of opportunities for therapeutic recreation job placement in psychiatric care, so take note of that. It talks a little bit about on here about how TR professionals interact and collaborate. This collaboration is something that we've talked about in some other chapters and all building up to this, and, and collaboration is when we work in interdisciplinary teams where it's recreation therapists, and it's nursing, and it's psychology, and it's dietary, and doctors and pharmacy and physical therapy and all of these groups work together to collaborate on an interdisciplinary team for the betterment of our patients. Um, another thing on this page that sticks out is next to the bottom, identify appropriate therapeutic recreation modalities and we know what modalities are, that's just our tools, what are we using, what activities are we doing. So we're finding out what's appropriate to use for people with certain mental disorders or certain symptoms. And we'll talk about some different disorders uh, mentally that, that people can run into as well. So the components of a healthy mind. This is something that you need to know. Um, there are four components of a healthy mind as far as psychosocial health, and they are listed right here. Um, it's kind of easy to remember if you look at mess, which is just the opposite of being <laughs> in good shape mentally. You could be a mess. Mental health, emotional health, social health and spiritual health. Those are the four uh, components of a healthy mind. So what is a mental disorder? And it's got on here the definition per DSM-4-TR, which is the therapeutic recreation portion. It's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is what this book is. And it's a big, thick book that's more to be used by psychologists and, and, and psychiatrists to make diagnosis on things like this. Um, it's used to assess, diagnose, and classify mental health disorders based on different categories 
of, of diagnostics. Um, the, it's a multi-axial system, as it says here, and this is kind of hard to just look at and realize what's going on without a little bit of background. So I'm gonna share some of this with you. Um, <coughs> axes one and two, um, they usually report various disorders. That's like an example would be having depression and dementia together. You would fall under axes one and two. Um, axis two, intellectual impairment and personality disorders. That would be such as, you know, mild mental retardation. Axis three, now I'm not gonna ask you to list a lot of these things. I'm just trying to help you understand what this book is. Axis three is relevant medical conditions. So we're talking about things such as Down syndrome, which can contribute to lower IQ, intellectual disability. Um, Alzheimer's can also fit in the axis three. Those are relevant medical conditions. Axis four, existing psychosocial and environmental problems. We're talking about things like coming from poverty, um, death of a family member perhaps would fit in this. Um, not having any health insurance, you know, that would fit in some of these environmental type problems. Axis five is reporting global assessment of functioning, which is GAF. Global Assessment of Functioning. You might want to remember what GAF stands for. And uh, honestly, I've never used this DSM-4 much myself. It's not really recreation therapist scope, but we need to know how the diagnostics are made as far as our clientele. So the role of therapeutic rec specialists in treating people with mental disorders. Again, we're part of a multidisciplinary team. Communication is critical. We have things called team meetings where you have everyone basically sitting around, you know, a round table discussion, everybody putting in their two cents about, you know, what we can do to help our, our patients. Um, if it's done the right way and you have a good leader, then things usually stay on track. You get a lot done. These meetings can also get a little bit hot. I can tell you, you have people who have differing opinions who think that what they're trying to do is more important than what somebody else is trying to do. When you start having those situations in a team meeting, um, it can get a little bit heated at the meetings, but it generally is, when, when people are reminded that we're all working together for the betterment of the clients, then things usually calm down and you get things done. Progress notes are another way that we can communicate and our progress notes are important to other people because they can look at the chart for each patient and see what we've done with them just as their progress notes are important to us. We may not have the opportunity to talk with each person on the team, but we can look at progress notes and see what's going on with our people. Direct communication is also important when we are trying to work as part of this multidisciplinary team. Something else that we try to do is make sure that therapeutic recreation, that process is integrated, incorporated into the entire comprehensive program treatment plan for each individual patient. They're each gonna have an individualized program plan. We talked about that during the chapter where we talked about the therapeutic recreation process. You know, you go through assessment and then you come up through the planning phase and they um, have a, individualized program plan that has goals and objectives and things that we're going to work on. So we have to make sure that we have specific um, recreation therapy portions in that IPP for our clients. So there's different levels of care 
and mental health. And this, this slide is a continuum going from, uh, we'll say most restrictive at the top to least restrictive at the bottom. Okay. Um, crisis care is a situation where the individuals are getting the most support. They are most of the time here, you're talking about people who are a risk to, to themselves or to others, um, maybe drug intervention or something like that. It's a crisis. They need basically 24 hour supervision. You also have residential care where they need um, a lot of assistance, supervision, but it's not exactly crisis care. Uh, there's a deinstitutionalization. That's a long, hard word. I don't want to say it again. Uh, movement that is going on right now. And, and part of what's causing this is that there's been a lack of funding to mental health facilities and a move to just in general deinstitutionalize. They want to get people out of long-term care facilities and into the community. And that's all fine and, and well for a lot of the clients and not so well for some others. There's some that if they were put back out in the community, they wouldn't last two weeks. They don't have family that would care for them. They don't have the skills to do things on their own. So what needs to happen is we need to make sure as recreation therapists and interdisciplinary teams that institutions are not what they used to be. That they're not a room where everybody is thrown into a room and not getting active treatment and not having things done with them. Institutions, uh, you know, the North Mississippi Regional Center in town here is far from that. They are, I wish I would have grown up there almost. I mean, they get to go on rec trips, they get activities every day, they don't have to worry about any meals, they're not ever bored. They, you know, everything that they need is right there. It is far from what you think of in the 1950s, an institution being, and you know, what you would see in some of the movies and all. From there, the next step on this continuum is the day treatment programs, where people just basically come in for the day, they receive services, and then they go home. Um, but, they're, it's almost like adult daycare to a degree. So they do have the service that lasts while their uh, loved ones are at work and things like that. They can get a respite from having to care for, for their, these individuals. And there's outpatient care, which is shorter term. They're not there for the whole day, things like that. Uh, forensic units are generally, um, these are under the care of the judicial system. And what they're looking for is the mental status of individuals. That's what's being done at forensic units. And then there's therapeutic communities, which kind of makes me think of like uh, areas of Florida where they have retirement communities. Now we're talking about mental health, but there can be uh, areas where there's far less restrictions and there's not as much supervision and these people are not as affected in their everyday activities as a lot of the others would be who are in the higher levels of care near the top of this page here. Schizophrenia and other psyche, psychotic disorders. So, the definition of psychotic. Um, when you are psychotic, we, we'll, we'll tie that in by talking about the symptoms. So when someone is dealing with psychosis, they're going to have delusions, hallucinations. As far as delusions, what those are are false beliefs. You need to know the difference between delusions and hallucinations. Delusions are false beliefs. You know, you think that, um, you truly think that someone is about to burst through your door and shoot you right now. 
you're scared to death because you actually believe that. That would be a delusion. Hallucinations are perceived sensory experiences that don't exist. And it's not just things that you see. It can be things that you hear. It can be things that you feel that don't exist, but they're sensory in nature and you perceive them to be real when you are in a bout of psychosis, but it's not actually happening. So delusions, false beliefs, hallucinations, perceived sensory experiences that don't exist. Catatonic behavior, um, that's basically like zoning out, just kind of out of it. Um, if people who are catatonic end up showing signs of being rigid. Um, they might be making purposeless movements, you know, just sitting and twiddling their fingers or something, but they're not doing anything else that would be fit in catatonic behavior. And then they also a lot of times have disorganized thinking where they just can't get their thoughts in order. It's kind of kind of going all over the place is what you end up seeing in that scenario. <clears throat> now, in people with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, the level of functioning is going to have a lot of variance from one person to the next. So as far as considerations for therapeutic recreation, you want to do different expressive activities. You want to give them an opportunity to, to express themselves, some coping strategies. Um, if they're able and ready, you want to provide socialization, things that can reduce anxiety. You want to try to give leisure awareness and resources and also give them the opportunity and, and help with developing activity skills that they need to be able to participate. Mood disorders. Um, I think all of us seem to have these from time to time. Um, but some, something I meant to say on, on the, the previous slide where we're talking about schizophrenia, delusions, I assure you that this is common enough that you have been in, you've sat in a, a college classroom with multiple classmates who have schizophrenia or who have delusions and hallucinations. You may not realize it and it's probably better that you didn't, but I'm just saying that it's common enough that that's the case. So, Anyway, you've also definitely sat in the room with, with people who have mood disorders. Um, what's going on here is a marked disturbance in mood that persists for a significant amount of time. Now, everybody has better days than others, myself included. The, the issue here is that, or the thing that you need to note is the significant amount of time. That's kind of the key to this. And there's different forms. The common forms are major depressive disorder. And what you're seeing there <clears throat> is just a cycle, a, a repeating situation of uh, major depressive episodes. You know, it comes and goes, comes and goes, but you have a lot of depressive episodes. Dysthymia is actually more persistent depression but it's less intense. So dysthymia, you're, you're depressed more of the time. You don't get those gaps in between, but it's not quite as uh, debilitating. You know, it's just more consistent. That's the difference there. Then you've got bipolar disorder where people tend to cycle between depressive and manic states is what you're going to see there. So they use medication for treatment for mood disorders a lot of the time. We know that exercise can help with mood. That's one thing that we can provide as recreation therapists. But as far as medication for treatment, they're looking to stabilize mood. You know, that's the thing that we're trying to find there. 
as far as therapeutic recreation modalities or considerations, some things I just kind of jotted down. Um, healthy fitness routines help with mood. Um, we can also help teach them coping skills, in, in, improve their self-concept, work on problem solving, relaxation techniques, things such as uh, challenge courses are good for groups with mood disorders, individuals with mood disorders, because, you know, they can get that, number one, you know, the challenge courses are set up in a way that you want them to succeed. And usually, with a, with a little bit of guidance, sometimes it might take, but they'll end up succeeding. When they succeed, what's going to happen to mood? Yay, we did good. We're happy now. So they'll feel better because of that. Um, that in itself is good. Plus, if you are totally wrapped up in an activity, trying to work as a team, you know that you have to pull your, your part. So what are you going to be thinking about during that time? The task at hand, which is going to take you away from this bad mood that you were in prior. So that's something else that plays into how challenge courses and things like that could be a good choice for people with mood disorders. Okay, anxiety disorders. Now this is super duper duper common. Um, and sometimes they make no sense at all. The things that, that you start to have when it comes to anxiety make no sense to people other than you who are feeling them at the time. Um, the two that we'll talk about right here, they can both lead to isolation, isolation and avoidance is kind of what you see coming out of this. Agoraphobia, that's where people start to be anxious about specific settings or places. Um, okay, I'll give you a little um, self story here. And it's, it's semi embarrassing, but it's just true. And this was a little while back. Gosh, it's been 10 or 15 years at this point. I was in Walmart one day and I had a buggy, a cart full of stuff. I'm going through, um, I was going by the pharmacy and I stopped and I took my blood pressure at the machine and it was a little higher than it should have been. And I was like, well, that's weird. And anyway, I got up, I started trying to get the rest of my stuff. And long story short, I ended up having what, I didn't even know what the heck was going on at the time. It ended up being a panic attack in Walmart. So I left a buggy full of crap in Walmart. Um, like had to sit down in the floor. It was ridiculous. I, there was no reason, nothing to cause it. I just had this strange like panic attack. What happened after that is even more embarrassing and weirder. And I can't believe I'm sharing this with you guys. But anyway, at that point, um, guess where I didn't want to go again? Walmart, because that's where it happened. So it was Walmart's fault and I was scared to go to Walmart. <laughs> so it took a little while before I actually wanted to go back in Walmart. So there's an example. Now I'm totally over that now. I know it makes no sense, but I had like this genuine, like, fear of going back in that store because that was where I had like a panic attack, which I'd never had before. Didn't know what in the world was going on. So from my panic attack, I got a case of agoraphobia and panic attacks. We all know kind of what those are. You have mental symptomology. You have physical symptomology when it comes to panic attacks. You know, your mind is racing. Your heart starts beating real fast. I mean, people can hyperventilate, start sweating, blood pressure can go up. All of these things, it's very, um, well, it's, it's not fun. Let me go back. I didn't mean to skip there. Um, so, but th those are both very, very common. Once you get agoraphobia, if it's severe, people end up spending the majority of their time 
at home when, you know, when they have major agoraphobia, they'll just stay home because they don't want to go out in public because they don't want to get embarrassed or they don't want, you know, something bad to happen. They think the sky is going to fall when they go places. And, and I'm not making fun of this whatsoever. It's just, it's, unless you deal with it, it's kind of hard to understand. Panic disorder is a common form um, where panic is just kind of easy to set off. You've also got obsessive compulsive disorder um, and something else to know the difference between here. Know the difference between obsessions and compulsions. Now, when you've got obsessive compulsive disorder, it's, uh, I'll just use locking the door to your house when you're leaving, for an example. Um, you lock the door, you start walking to the car, and you're like, hmm, did I lock my door? I don't think I locked my door. No, I need to go check it. So then you go back and you check the door, it's locked. And you still lock it again, just to be sure. You start walking again, uh, no, I need to make sure it's locked. And it's, it's like that. And it can be that way with like hand washing and things like that. You just, but obsession is the mental side of it where you can't stop thinking about doing a specific thing or wondering whether something was done. Compulsions are the actions that you take to try to get rid of the obsessions. You know, is my door locked? Is my door locked? So your compulsion is going and turning the handle on your door to see if it's locked. Post-traumatic stress disorder, we know what that is. Um, you hear about that a lot from people who have traumatic events. Um, soldiers who've gone to war, people who were, in, you know, at 9-11 when it happened have PTSD. Definitely an anxiety disorder where they have triggers that usually kind of take them back to that place where they had their trauma in their mind and it, it sets them off. So for therapeutic recreation um, here, we want to try to do things like systematic desensitization strategies. So like for me, when I didn't want to go to Walmart, I thought I would go back and pass out again or, or you know, have another panic attack. Um, as a recreation therapist, we can take people out in the uh, community on outings and things. So maybe something that somebody would have done for me if they were serving me during that time would be to, hey, we're just gonna go to Walmart today and we're gonna, we're just gonna park right out front and we're gonna sit there and you'll see that you'll be fine. And then we'll come back another day and we'll, we'll walk in, but we'll only go in about 10 steps and we'll sit there for a little while. You systematically desensitize. Eventually you spend a little more time, you go a little deeper in the store, things like that. Before long, the person sees that that particular situation is not going to harm them and they start to desensitized to that. That's one good thing that we can do for sure for people with anxiety disorders. So know the difference between agoraphobia, panic attacks, know the difference between obsessions and compulsions, and kind of know about what post-traumatic stress disorder is. Eating disorders. There are some common forms listed here. Anorexia, bulimia, and it's, it's stated here that it's differentiating between the two is based on whether or not body weight is maintained. So the way of kind of getting that across in an easy to way, easy to understand format, anorexia is who you think of being abnormally thin, you know, far, far, far too thin. These individuals look in the mirror, and although they are skinny, skinny, they still see, oh, I'm so fat and disgusting. That's 
just kind of the way it is. And it's common, and there's probably people in this class that have fought with this or bulimia. And it's much more common in females than it is in males, these eating disorders. Um, in anorexia, you're going to see significant weight loss. In bulimia, this is where you think of people binging and purging more so, where they are, you know, pigging out and then going and making their self throw up or taking laxatives and things like this to get rid of all the food that they ate. People who participate in bulimia, and I say participate in, it's not really something you want to participate in. People who have bulimia um, are going to be different in that when you look at them, you're not going to say, hmm, they have an eating disorder because they're going to be within 10 pounds of optimal weight for someone their gender age etc so they're not going to stand out anorexia you lose a lot of weight bulimia not so um, symptoms binging and purging refusal to eat over exercising and other unhealthy strategies for weight loss so what can we do for um, people who have eating disorders as therapeutic recreation specialists. Um, we probably should, first off, I'll start with some things that we probably shouldn't do. Um, we probably shouldn't put someone with anorexia on a cardiovascular um, aerobic exercise program. We know exercise improves mood, but we don't want to worsen their weight loss by what we're doing. Um, we also probably wouldn't want to take someone with anorexia or bulimia to the uh, Lafayette County chili cook-off. Probably wouldn't be a good activity choice. You know, they have issues with food. Um, so we probably wouldn't want to do an activity with them that centers around food as the main factor and that just makes sense. Um, some things that we can do is when we are around places that have um, eating as part of what's going on, make sure that we monitor them. We try to help improve their self-concept, um, help them with coping skills and talk about healthy lifestyle because part of what we do as recreation therapists as is we educate on health, you know, healthy benefits to our patients as well. Leisure education and things like that. We want to educate. Adjustment dis disorders. These are situations where there are psychological responses to significant stressors in life. So what might be a significant stressor in life? Somebody hit me with one. Schoolwork. <laughs> Absolutely. Changing jobs. Becoming an adult. Yeah. Hey, I like all of those. Very good. Um, death in the family. Changing a job. Losing a job. Um, losing a pet. It, Tons of different things could fit as a significant stressor and, and every one of those works for me. And what happens is basically this psychological response to these stressors makes it hard for you to adjust and it's going to impair your daily functioning. Um, <clears throat> so it can involve things like depression, anxiety, and maladaptive behavior changes. I like that fancy word. Um, Actually, all it means is behavior changes that aren't for the best. Those are doing bad things. If you're showing maladaptive behavior, you are showing behaviors that are inappropriate. So know that maladaptive equals inappropriate. As far as working with individuals with adjustment disorders, we're going to try to help them with coping skills, enhance their self-concept or their view of themselves, 
and let them know that they can do things to help uh, exercise personal control, that they have control of their self and that helps them to gain back their daily functioning skills when they think of their self as being in control. Some theoretical considerations and here we go again there's some things on here that I really like um, but theories are not my favorite it kind of fits in with with history you know theories to me are just like a lighthouse they kind of direct someone in you know your therapy efforts in a certain direction you know where the light is shining that's kind of you just go that direction it's not necessarily lined up you have to do things exactly a certain way um, there's three critical elements according to person-centered approach by Carl Rogers and I like these for sure the first one is unconditional positive regard and what we're talking about there is we want to give people the benefit of the doubt as a therapist if you're working in a substance abuse center or if you are working at a correctional facility even you need to try to work with upr unconditional positive regard and say to yourself that all people are inherently good uh, only behavior is bad this is a good person they can they can overcome this you know think of people as good sometimes they have bad behaviors Congruence or genuineness is another thing that's brought up there. What that means is that you just, your client needs to believe that you truly care, that you are being genuine. Empathetic understanding, that's exactly what it sounds. They need to see not only that you care about them, but that you are empathetic to what is going on with them. As far as a person-centered approach, those three things right there you give them the benefit of the doubt up front they're going to uh, see that you truly believe in them and in what you're doing and then that you actually have empathy for what they have gone through that's that's the kind of what that's all about um there's table 10 one in the book talks about active listening and related to communication skills so active listening is important when someone's talking to you and they and you are actively listening it means a lot I can say that unequivocally as as an instructor when you're up there talking and people are actively listening it makes you feel a lot better than when people are not that's just a fact and I know some days are harder than others and some topics are harder than others but it's just true and we know what active listening is it's when you're actually engaged you're making eye contact you're nodding your head you're repeating some of the things that they're saying and and some of the things that we do are paraphrase back to the person talking to you so what so what you just said is you don't like to go to walmart because you get panic attacks there that would be paraphrasing um reflecting you think back on um, what they said and try to get a little meaning to it clarifying sometimes when someone's talking to you you may not understand exactly what they said and you may need to have them clarify so you ask a question that shows that you're listening to get them to clarify so when you said this did you mean this or this and and then they know that you heard what they said and that you're listening and then they give you the answer to help clarify your question as far as summarizing um, that's basically a lot like paraphrasing where you just take what they're saying put it into a condensed version and give it back to them to make sure that they know that you heard what they said to you some common mistakes that are seen in this person-centered approach and through you know active listening and communication is parroting which is basically you're repeating everything they say or I know some people and have had some friends that when I'm talking to them they actually 
would start talking along with me, like finishing my sentences as I'm saying them. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. You know, like they're trying to predict what I'm saying. That's a get gets kind of uh, distracting to say the least. Inadequate attention. You're just not really paying attention. Mismatching verbal and nonverbal messages. We know that nonverbal messages say a lot with how, you know, in, in communication in general. Um, talking too much. Sometimes when people are talking, they just need you to shut up and listen to what they're saying. You know, show that you care. But if you're talking too much, you're not giving them the opportunity to vent. And hasty advice is another thing that can be a problem at times. Another theory, and we've all probably, if you've taken a psychology course, you've heard of behaviorism by B.F. Skinner. This is kind of a psychological theory here. And it has to do with operant conditioning. So basically in operant conditioning, what we're talking about, there's a triggering event that occurs, and then there's a behavior that takes place in response to the trigger once, and then there's a consequence of your response and it's, the, the, it's either desirable or undesirable. Um, on page 154 in the book, there's a good example, a uh, practical example of operant conditioning. I don't have the book handy or I would go over it with you. There's a lot of different reinforcement techniques that are listed here and they are in table 10-2. Um, I would be, take the time to go through and look at table 10-2. It would probably be worth your time to know what things like shaping, chaining, fading, extinction. You know, fading is like when you are uh, helping someone, helping your kid learn how to ride a bike and you're, you're holding on to the bike, running behind the bike. Eventually you start letting go for a few seconds and then you have to grab back onto the bike. Then the better they get at keeping their balance, the more you're able to let go of the bike. Eventually you can fade until they're riding the bike by themselves. Good example of that. But take a little time to go through. I have spoon fed you guys most of the information so far. So take a little time on your own and look at table 10 too. Look at these things and be ready to identify them on a test at the very least. Attribution theory. Another theoretical consideration. Um, basically what this is, attribution is how people perceive their successes and failures in life um, and the consequences of these perceptions. You know, like what is causing my success? What's causing my failure? What are the consequences of this? So there's something here called learned helplessness. And it's, it's common in people who have mental issues. Um, learned helplessness basically happens when a person thinks that they're inadequate, AKA helpless, then they're more likely to be depressed. And that's a situation where you really do uh, just learn to feel helpless. They do it to themselves. Causal attributions. Um, th what that is basically are a person's explanation of why they fail, why they succeed, or why they find happiness. Um, what is the cause of it? It's how we explain that to ourselves. Some therapeutic approaches to negative thinking. Um, some things that you can do is point out negative thinking. Like sometimes we have to be tough love to a, you know, to a degree. If we see people that are, you know, uh, thinking negatively 
and talking negatively consistently and we catch that happening, we may need to snap them out of it and be like, hey, you're, you got to turn that around and think in a positive way rather than stay wallowing where you are right now. Um, Self-efficacy theory, that refers to the extent that a person thinks that they can succeed at a given task. How self-efficient, how do I think I can do this? What's my self-efficacy? That's the amount you believe that you can do something or not. And what influences that are things like your past for performance. Last time I tried this, how did it go? Um, vicarious experience, like by from watching someone else do something in particular. Um, visualizing what might happen when you attempted it. Something that you want to do that can influence someone's thoughts as far as their self-efficacy is influence their feelings by uh, creating, okay, prior to a football game or a basketball game, baseball game, whatever sports, um, are the athletes sitting in there or, or do they come out during warm ups to uh, Mozart? Probably not, you know. Um, they want to influence them by helping them to get pumped up by playing music that's going to get them hyped up and feel like they're ready to play. That's an influencing factor, whether they realize it or not. When they start to feel more pumped up and more ready to go, then their self-efficacy feelings are going to improve. They're gonna feel more in tune with what's going on. That's the best way I can think of to kind of explain that. Um, next, the psychoanalytic theory. And, you know, this is some things that overall it's, it's acknowledgement that the unconscious mind can influence behavior. And that's true. We all know that, that our mind is very, very, very powerful. And a lot of times we don't even have to actually be thinking of something specifically for it to be influencing what we're doing. Um, defense mechanism. Mechanisms, they're basically used to subconsciously protect our psychological well being. That's what we're talking about there. Again, here's another table that I want you guys to take a little bit of time to look at on your own. Table 10 3, it talks about all of these different things that are listed here from denial, displacement, and intellectualization, projection, regression. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the two below that, transference and counter-transference. And you need to know what these are. Transference is a situation where the patient begins to associate the therapist with a person, person or situation from their past. Um, and you're talking about somebody with, with mental illness of some sort, um, some sort of mental issue you know, issue with their mental health, the person starts to, it, I mean, it almost sounds like something you could start a movie from. Um, but the patient starts to see the recreation therapist as, and this can be a positive or a negative. It can be, you can remind them of their mother, who may be their favorite person in the world. And so they, they, they may do anything they can to make you happy and they'll participate in everything that you do. Or you may remind them of um, their, the high school principal that used to whip your tail all the time when you were in school. I don't know, uh, somebody that, that they did not like at all. And if they start, when they look at you, that's who they see is a person that they didn't like, then it's very much a negative. So think about it, it can go either, either way. Counter transference is basically never good 
And this situation is where the therapist starts to associate the client with a significant person or event. So it touches home and you're, that person doesn't really deserve or shouldn't be equated to anything from your past or somebody from your past. So as a, as a recreation therapist, your goal is to not ever let counter transference happen where you start to see them, you know, as somebody else or equate them to somebody or something from your past. Um, some things that we can try to do to help minimize these defense mechanisms that people have. Um, a lot of times there are things that are called social contracts where group members hold each other accountable based on, you know, predetermined group values. And where you see that a lot of times is in a setting of, say, alcohol and drug rehabilitation settings. If you have a, a group of individuals that are really trying to get better and are working together, they'll hold each other accountable, you know, and, the, and you really see this where you have social contracts, which basically if somebody is not uh, behaving in a way that the group thinks that they should, somebody calls them out, which is helpful to us as therapists. So we talked about what modalities do we want to use for people who have issues with mental health. Leisure education, obviously that's important and that's going to fit with almost every group that we'll talk about. It's uh, we need to work on education content that's specific to the needs of improving their mental health. Values clarification. Um, we can talk to them, work with them to find out what their true core beliefs are. And we need to find that out. And once we find that out, we say, okay, well, you need to make your behavior match that. This is what you're telling me you truly believe to be good and the things that you should, that you need to do. So let's make your behavior match that. And like I say, sometimes we have to be the bad guy and call people out if they're not doing those things. Uh, stress management, we can try to control physiological changes that happen through things like relaxation. Um, it may be a deal. I mean, there's things that you can even read where you can have people relax. Okay, I want you to turn off the lights. Everyone close your eyes. I want you to go pretend that you're in a hot air balloon. You know, you can walk people through this whole situation before you know it, you'll have a room full of people that are asleep but you can do guided relaxation like that. You can do things like uh, yoga, Tai Chi, aerobics, you know, helps to improve mood and things like that. That helps with stress. Some uh, group initiatives that happen. This constructivism philosophy is basically you're leading clients over gaps you know um and some examples of that is like physical gaps that you're helping clients to construct a solve to to solve or like a ropes course would be an example of physical uh, cognitive would be a situation where you provide them with something like a riddle or a problem that they're able to cross that gap. Social, you help them to work on things like cooperating with other people or even competition is, a, is, is social in nature. And psychological, you want to address the things that they are dealing with like fear, anxiety, frustration with themselves even. Some other things that we can do our self-esteem programs. Some are activity-based and in those activities, the things that we need to remember is that it's important for us to give them the opportunity to build successes. We want them to 
be able to be successful and to uh, be challenged yet be able to be successful. That's a, that's a fine line and it's hard to find that exact point where someone is optimally, you know, stimulated for a activity challenged, but it's not so hard that they can't complete it. If it's too easy, it's not going to give them any, they're going to be almost, you know, well, you made that too easy for me. You know, they're not going to have a lot of good feelings out of it. Um, reflective things that work on self-esteem are things like written work, journals, you know, people that like to write in diaries and things like that. They can work on self-esteem in that way. And then also expressive therapies. What do you guys think would be a good expressive therapy? Painting. Yep, absolutely. Painting, drawing, ceramics, uh, writing stories, poems, any kind of art, things like that are good ways to be expressive. Um, it could even be, gosh, I saw a, a, a television show the other day where uh, the mother lost her child in an accident and her way of coping was to, she did like a play, basically. Um, I, I forget what they call what she was doing, but she was basically on stage by herself acting out this play and it was very much expressive and it was very much therapeutic to her because that was her way of coping with the loss of her child now would that work for everyone absolutely not if i had a loss in my family i think the last thing i would want to do is get on stage in front of a bunch of people and prance around and do you know a show for a bunch of people it would be far from what would be therapeutic to me but like i say everyone is different and that's something that we need to remember all right that's going to i believe wrap us up on chapter 10. again these you know at the end of each one of these PowerPoint sessions and, and something that I thought about doing because we're not able to meet and all and just the way of y'all getting uh, some points. I thought about having you answer some of these questions as discussions, like as part of the course. Um, I'm not going to do that because that's just something else I'd have to grade, number one, and I'm doing enough of that as it is. But these are, these are really good ways to see if you get what the chapter was about, good ways to study prior to the test. So just remember to take a look at some of these discussion questions as well as some of the things that I mentioned. You know, look at table 10 too. Um, if I tell you to look at something like that, you should probably do it. So that's it for chapter 10. What I will do is prior to our next class, I will send out another email. So you guys be sure Get in the habit of checking your emails at least, you know, once a day, because not just myself, but your teachers might be sending you things that you need to see. Um, I'll give you all an update of what's coming up next class, and we'll just move forward from there. So thank you guys for coming today, kind of. Um, and you all have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Later, people. Thank you. Thank you all.